guess we'd like to just open it up to questions or comments you all might have. Yes. Uh, my name is Brian Bob. Thanks for being here and for doing this. It's awesome. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I thought entertainment was a great way to get people in the community involved and inspired. And of course we're in Austin, so music and food, all those are good you know, cues to get people to come in and get them excited and interested in it. But what I had a question about was just languaging. It went from global warming to climate change. And that seems so, you know, versus climate catastrophe or disaster or that's disruption. One, disruption, yeah. I mean, something. Does anybody know where it changed from just from global warming to climate change? Yeah, I do. Um, it, in 1991, you know, it was pretty, I was working in Europe at the time, it was pretty well established that we'd add enough carbon dioxide to our atmosphere that we were going to warm it up. But, uh, so, so global warming was the word, but what scientists started realizing is that global warming at having extra heat in our atmosphere actually has a much broader impact than just warming the planet, and they thought that that word was, that language was too narrow. So climate change was brought in because it's a larger, it sort of says more things are going on than just warming. And, um, but I think that climate change is actually not the best language right now either, and I saw something um, with the whole polar vortex last week, that was <laughs> global weirdness, and and then I, then that kind of struck me as like maybe that's a better better kind. Of, but definitely, I think it's a great question because there's a PR there's a PR problem, um, and and so yeah, I mean branding is is, is this, I think you're right. You know that that's something that needs to be improved. One thing I wanted to add to that just is that um, I, disruption. Climate disruption, I think, is a term that I find pretty useful because it's very disruptive on many different levels. But but one thing I just wanted to mention, we're, we're in a bit of a bubble here in Austin, as I'm sure everyone knows. And uh, when we get together uh, with uh, representatives from government and other places, they're amazed that we can even say climate change and climate protection, which is what our program here is called, the city. They can't even talk about climate change and many other municipal and state governments. States is a different issue here, but they're so blown away that we uh, actually use this, this language here at all. Um, and so I, I just think it's uh, important for us to note that you know there, there's a lot of variation depending on where you are and what uh, what kind of organization you work for, what level of government you're in, with, with what language is going to work for you. And just one, one footnote to that, because this this ends up being a pretty darn important point when you want to really get down there and solve problems. And, you know, I always ask myself, what do I want more? You know, to win people over on my language or to solve problems? And what I do find is that if you, if you um, peel back the language and just go to the sort of the big blocks of environmental protection and talk about clean water and clean air and healthy oceans, there just isn't an advocacy group out there trying to figure out how to screw up water and oceans. And, and you can almost not find a stable adult that would knowingly pass on a planet that is dirtier to their, you know, so right. you, you can get people on the ground. And I think that's a great place to get people because it, it, captures, it captures them. The other language that's very useful because the impacts of climate change that we are seeing in, in many cases are natural disasters. So disaster preparedness, there, you know, there's really nobody that's against disaster preparedness. <laughs> so whatever's causing the disaster to happen, we can debate that for a long time, but they are happening. So um, you know, working with our Homeland Security office here, uh, integrating climate adaptation measures into a lot of our different planning efforts, um, you know, we, we don't even really have to talk about climate change in that conversation. In truth and advertising, we didn't talk about climate change for the first year that we were working this through. We talked about drought, we talked about death of trees, because, like you say, there's no reason to stir up hornet's nest if someone's going to fight you on it and not listen to what the point mm -hmm. is. So uh, the language is often really important just to get people past the barrier that they might have. But we weren't, we didn't. Mm -hmm. Can I add Say something that. to that? Maybe four years ago, was to get the Austin Sierra Club to start saying climate change. The very important that you don't say climate change or global warming, 
they're, they're frightening things. Uh, climate disruption is a frightening one too. The solutions are not frightening. The solutions are going to be very simple. They're not going to cost hardly anything at all. I prefer climate pollution. What happens is all those other things. What it is, is climate pollution. Just like any other kind of pollution, it's only going to cost about as much as we spend on advertising across the planet every year to deal with climate pollution. So I'm, I'm advocating let's, let's step back a little bit and call it what it is, and then we can call what happens afterwards all these other things, and, and they are really frightening, and the stuff we've seen is just the beginning. Thank you. I, I just kind of had a comment. This will probably date me, but back in the Carter administration in the 19 whatever, the 70s, there was this kind of back to the land movement that happened. All across the United States, it went from Mexico to Vermont. And this back to the land movement I became aware of because we bought a farm at this time in 77 outside of Granger, not too far from Taylor. And the back to the land movement, the idea behind it was because of the oil, everybody was, quote, using too much oil, and there were going to be an oil shortage. And so everybody was supposed to economize and recycle and figure out other ways to heat their homes and do all this. That was a whole movement back then. And they had people out in New Mexico using, you know, oil drums to use water and to eat their house. They had people here in Austin with the maximum potential movement recycling the caliche from the soil to make the, the solar reflector using rock storage. They had water things for wood bubble. Uh, the reason why I know this, my husband was in science, he was a science teacher. He landed up going up to Vermont to uh, the Wood Hole and visiting all of the different places about the water issues and then um, the earth issues. And we landed up using this farm, which was 100 acres, to build a passive solar home back in 1977. And then we had a hydroponic greenhouse using water. And I could tell you that we learned so much in that process of doing that of how water, we had a well, it ran dry so we couldn't use the greenhouse. We were, had environmental issues. We had two creeks. It flooded. We had to figure out what to do. It, we had a drought, and everything was grasshoppers and crickets everywhere. I mean, we learned everything just in Texas on this little farm way out north, you know. And, of course, we've been environmental advocates from the, the 70s. And yet, you know, now we had to move into Austin for circumstances I won't go into. But when we moved to Austin, we converted our home into kind of the recycled stuff. You know, we have the water barrels, we have zero escaping, we have all those 20th century things that they come up with, the recent stuff. We haven't got the solar panels yet because they're damn expensive and we're kind of waiting for that to come down. But they're all of these things. But integrated with all that, I should say, I used to be the former, you know, associate director to Women in the Work. And I was an art curator out of Houston. And so I was very involved with art. And so I created things at my farm. Right now I'm trying to build a labyrinth or, you know, maze or something like that. But it's just there are all kinds of things uh, that we have done with that farm back starting in the 70s. 40 acres is in organic soil now. We sell the beef to, the, you know, local uh, Betsy Ross who sells beef at Whole Foods. We have chickens. We have goats. We have horses and cows, but we have people maintaining this stuff out there who can live there. We can't live there anymore. We have to live in Austin. So raising two kids, doing all of that, I think everybody as an individual, no matter where they are, can do the simplest things that can be beautiful, that can be environmentally sound, and that can utilize everything that you guys have been talking about here in a wonderful way. And I think the project that Women in the Work did was fantastic. I mean, it was incredible because it reached out to the community. And if those artists are here, I want them to stand up so we can clap for them because they really were, were extraordinary to come up with that idea and to utilize it in such a big, big way. I mean, I go kayaking in the lake and I was kayaking around that tree a lot, but it was really, really an amazing and very important project for the city. And I'd love to see Women in the Work and the other art institutions in this town do those kinds of things. I know uh, AMOA, I was a curator at AMOA for a while, Austin Museum of Art, now what is it called, the Contemporary? 
They have a landscape there, a fabulous landscape, and they have money to do sculpture gardens out there on the land, and that's over there on 35th Street. And you can walk down there, and they, they hired several artists, you know, to do environmental works on the lake and on the land. So the art activity here in Austin is, you don't see it as visibly as you do the music scene and the politics mm -hmm. and all the other stuff. But, you know, this art in public places has done an enormous amount. So there is a lot of energy for, with artists here in town, and but individuals, you know, the xeroscaping project has taken off, and there's so much individuals can do just in a very small way in their own home, whether it's, you know, you got an apartment and you have a pot garden, you know. There's so many things that art can do as well as teach, like you said, which is real, real important. That's a uh, comment, I just took the most time. <laughs> I'm curious with each of you, um, and Julie, you talked about the image that sort of got you going, but what each of you, for you, was your eco-epiphany, or like the thing that really like woke you up, and maybe it was an image, or, you know, or <coughs> in addition to that question, I'm also interested, is there a, a statistic or an image that kind of sticks with you that you, is, is like a, a motivator for you that you can keep in mind to keep going on this? Um, well, I, actually, so I did have an epiphany, it's not... Positive though, but, um, it, it, it happened when I, I ha it happened when I had a really bad fever, and I woke up in the middle of the night and I I asked myself how did I become an ocean scientist stuck in Austin, Texas, and you know 45 years old and obsessed with jellyfish, and I, and I how did and I was feverish really literally. And so I wrote down like all these moments in my life about how I got to this spot right now. And they were like, oh, I failed this horrible exam, so I had to switch my major. And I was dating this really bad guy, so I had to like, you know, break <laughs> like, like I have I moved with him when I shouldn't have. And you know, like it, there were all these really low points. And then it hit me that, oh my gosh, like the only times I've ever actually made a big change were when things were so uncomfortable I couldn't stand it. Mm -hmm. And then it hit me that we're not making changes because we're not uncomfortable mm -hmm. right now. Our lives are pretty good and we're not prepared to make a change yet. So I had this epiphany and I don't know exactly what to do with it because it, it concerns me a lot. Um, we're still so comfortable, and and um, and I'm worried about that. What I did was write the book Spineless as kind of something I could do, but I don't, you know, I don't know. I, I so that's where my epiphany is, and it's not maybe the most optimistic one. I'm sorry. One of the uh, people that wrote about this show. Uh, talked about in this installation, talked about how artists had responded so effectively and so in such large numbers to the AIDS crisis and how that had not been replicated with the environmental crisis. And there was a lot of questioning, why haven't artists risen to this in the way that they did? Uh, part of that might be the personal connection that many people had to those who had AIDS, but I do think there is a lot to be done still, to, to, to a lot more to make people's awareness increase about what they can do. I think one of the things that's so powerful is just to spend more time in nature, and, and I'm sure, Laura, you could speak to this, how important it is for us to get children out into nature, and how disconnected we really are from the environment now. And we also have a tendency to think about the environment as this thing kind of outside the city uh, and how much of nature is actually in the city. I'm, a, I'm constantly amazed in Austin how many different species we're coexisting with. And uh, I, I had a, a really amazing experience when I was living in Travis Heights um, along one of the little greenways there um, with a hawk that, that came regularly down to the tree right next to my deck. And we, we would just kind of look at each other, and, and uh, it, it, I heard from neighbors that got very upset when I moved away. It was making a lot of noise, and they were like, get the hawk, because it's getting loud. But, 
for me, growing up, it was very important and, and had a huge impact on the rest of my life to uh, spend quite a bit of time uh, going hiking and backpacking. Um, my father was the chairman of the, the San Antonio chapter of the Sierra Club where I grew up. And uh, in, the, in the 70s, uh, was leading a, a fight to stop the 281 North Freeway, which now exists, <laughs> obviously, and I've used it many times, but uh, it, it, you know, it was going to go right past and did go right past the San Antonio Zoo and over a lot of recharge zone, and Sierra Club was very active in trying to, to stop that at the time. So I was uh, you know, having experiences uh, of being out with the, the trees planted in front of the bulldozers and, and uh, those kind of things. So as a kid, that was very impactful for me, and I'm very, very grateful to my, to my dad, not only for that leadership, but for spending so much time taking our family out into nature and, um, you know, trying to outfit a family of five with backpacking gear is not an inexpensive <laughs> <laughs> So, I did not have an eco-epiphany, I'll say that up front. Um, and, and like Lucia, and part of it is how I was raised, you know, I had a lot of access to uh, I'm the youngest of five kids. My father was a professor at UT, and we took that track camper trailer and home all over the United States. And and what I learned from that is, you know, if you kind of want to understand your relationship to the world, stand next to a redwood. You know, <laughs> you'll figure out what your relationship. You know, I, the smells of geysers, the you know, just all of those experiences that you have in nature. That's what caused me to love nature. Uh, that is not what I'm trying to necessarily accomplish with others. I love the idea of getting children out in nature more. I love the idea of getting children out from behind screens and climbing into trees. But I'm even more attracted in making sure that people see themselves in these issues, not necessarily using my teaspoons, but using theirs. And I think that we, I think I've got a beat on the age in the room. I, I, I think we have, and I tell my staff this all the time, you know, we cannot measure someone's love of nature and conservation using our teaspoons. It's not fair and it won't work. Um, if we really, really want people to relate to this on their terms, we have to be respectful of how kids use technology today. We have to integrate that into nature so that they can experience on their terms. And so, you know, my epiphany is really, it's not about me. <laughs> I'm also the mother of four, so it's rarely about me. <laughs> uh, you know, I want to make it about other people. I want people to see themselves and the importance of this work. I have a question. Um, when you were talking about that you don't see the change, and I notice that a lot because I, I go up to New Mexico a lot, and I come back to Austin. You go to New Mexico, and water is a very big issue there. And it has been for the 30 years I've been visiting. And I go there, and I know immediately take, you know, a two-minute shower, be very cautious. I have friends that live there. If they don't go to the ditch meeting, they don't get water that week to their property. You know, um, it's very uh, enlightening. And I come back to Austin, and it's, it's different. It's completely different, although we're in the same situation. And I was wondering, with, this was a great piece because I work with a lot of people who have uh, the same kind of mentality of you come back to Austin and you forget that the rest of the world, Africa, you know, you got to walk two miles for one gallon of water. You know, New Mexico, you really don't get water at your table at a restaurant. But you come back to Austin, it's a very different here. And this piece showed several of my coworkers who we don't vote along the same party lines. We don't agree on a lot of the same moral issues, but they were very. Um, it was a very thought-provoking and it opened up the conversation at least. And I think that's what art should do is make us think and make us talk about it. My question though is for the city of Austin lady is, is Austin going to get any better that way? I and mean, I'm not pointing fingers at you, but I do notice, you know, I talked to a guy at Shady Grove who brought me a giant tub of water and I said, isn't that against the rules? And he said, no, so many people complain, we just do it. And they throw them all away. And, it, and, and I, you know, I stayed at a hotel when my air conditioning broke. There's no signs in the rooms about, you know, water conservation and towels and sheets. And you go anywhere else in the country and it's there. But I didn't, I don't see it here like I do other places. And it's because I guess we're so comfortable. We really haven't 
haven't had to live yet that way. And I wonder, does, you know, with all the people that are moving here, I mean, how are we dealing, how are we going to deal with all of those toilets? I know in New Mexico, <laughs> well, we sold my mother-in-law's house. And when it went up for sale, we suddenly got all these bizarre phone calls from contractors and architects. They wanted to come out and replace from two toilets because they couldn't put two toilets in whatever projects they were working on until they replaced two old toilets with water conserving toilets. And I was like, wow, we get two free toilets just because of that. I thought it was a fact. And that doesn't really happen here at all because I guess we're still really comfortable, like you said. And I wondered if the city is, well, is even aware that they're that <laughs> Gosh, where do I start? <laughs> uh, uh, I would say that uh, the awareness is changing, and there's been a huge shift just in the three years I've been in the role here um, as, as Chief Sustainability Officer. There's been a huge shift in the dialogue at the city, uh, and within the last uh, six months, uh, the director of our water utility has said things and used language I've never heard him use before. So I, I actually think things really are shifting. Um, we're, I don't know if you've heard that just because of the severity of the drought that we are in now, um, we are actually entertaining the possibility of going to what would be called stage four watering restrictions, which would mean you would not be allowed to use potable water to irrigate anything. Um, that has not been discussed before. So even the fact that, you know, uh, that, that's in the conversation uh, in front of city council, I think is huge. Um, I don't know if you saw in, in the paper that the LCRA is now looking at you know, raising rates which won't directly impact us because we are currently on a long-term contract but in the surrounding communities. So uh, we've had big shifts in our, in our rates for uh, electricity as well. So, you know, price signals I think are very important but also the, the mandatory requirements that uh, are being entertained as a part of the land use code. We actually have a huge opportunity right now with the updating of the land use code to do a lot of things and make some sweeping changes. I've certainly given my wish list to the folks that are working on that project.